<clears throat> Revelation chapter 17, beginning in verse 7, and I'm reading in the English Standard Version. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast, because it was and is not, and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who those with him are called and faithful, called and chosen and faithful. Now let's pray. Father, we ask now that this morning by your word that you would instruct us that this word, which is a grace from you, that you have spoken to your, your servants, to the followers of Jesus Christ, your son, to show us these things that are soon to take place, as you say in Revelation 1, verse 1, Lord, that you would use these words to equip us so that we would receive the blessing promised in Revelation 1, verse 3, the blessing for all who hear and who keep what is written in this, for the time is near. We ask that you would fix our eyes this morning on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that you would fix our hearts on Christ, that we would love him and worship him. And Lord, so that you would fix our faith upon all that you have done through your Son to make us your people acceptable to you through faith in Jesus Christ, righteous, restored, holy as a people, a kingdom of priests to our God and Savior through Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would build us up in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. Give me one more minute before I uh, begin the sermon. Uh, let me close my window so that we hear less of the noise outside. Sorry about that. Well, hold your Bibles then, and would you follow along with me as we dive into Revelation chapter 17, verses 7 through 14. The title of my message this morning is The Mystery of the Beast. And I want to begin uh, by re recalling to your memory uh, one of those villains in fiction, in movies of the 20th century, that people most love to hate. And that villain, of course, that I'm speaking about is... Uh, made famous by the Disney movie 101 Dalmatians, Cruella de Vil. Uh, I, I love the way Glenn Close captured uh, that character in the live-action version of that movie, but the, the movie was much better in the original cartoon. Nonetheless, Cruella de Vil was not invented by Disney, but was a character in a 1956 book by Dodie Smith. The book was called uh, 101 Dalmatians, and... Uh, and, and really in that book, Cruella comes off the page as a, as a character that almost rings with real life malice and, and, and cruel, cruelty. The name Cruella de Vil is, is a play on words for cruel devil. And in the book, she's married uh, uh, to a, a rich furrier, uh, someone who trades in furs. And, and uh, the, the furrier's name in the whole book is never mentioned. And at one point, Cruella de Vil is asked by another what her married name is. And she replies that, that when she got married to him, she made him take her name. And it just, it fits with how she is portrayed in that book that she domineers him 
and he obeys her. Her husband obeys her completely. She rules the household. She manages every detail of the household so that the house is always hot. The fires are always roaring, even in the summertime. And she's always wearing her fur coat, even in the summertime, in the heat. And her house is appropriately called Hell Hall. She steals, in the book, she steals almost a hundred Dalmatian puppies because she likes the fur of the puppies better than the adult dogs. And she, she's uh, stealing the puppies to get their fur. But in the end, her, of course, her crimes are discovered and her husband's business is destroyed and Cruella is forced to sell Hell Hall. And it's a fitting, it's a just end to the book. But it's just a story, right? One spinoff has the, of the character Cruella, uh, a spinoff of that character calls her the Dark Queen or the Queen of Darkness. But again, it's, it's just a story. You see, when, when I was only about 15 years old, that was the first time that I was introduced to the true identity of this character, this prostitute, the symbolic woman in chapter 17 of Revelation called Babylon the Great, the great prostitute. And since that time, for many years, uh, as a young person, and in, into my 20s and 30s, I have to confess to you that I often cheered at the very idea of Babylon's judgment. That, that, that this entity symbolized by the great prostitute would, would get what she deserves in the end. And so oftentimes my, my thinking about Babylon the Great and my hopes for the future were characterized more by a sort of a delight that she would be punished in the end. I cheered at her destruction as I read it in Bible prophecy. And yet, isn't that misplaced? That's not what we're called to in this passage. That's not what this passage is really about. It's not meant to see God's people stand up and cheer at the destruction of some people that God has created. In my last sermon on Revelation chapters uh, chapter 17 verses 3 through 6 I, I showed from those verses that this woman this uh, great prostitute called Babylon the Great in verse 5 that she represents a city like Babylon a city that some in some ways like the ancient city of Babylon but that she's also a great and prominent false church a church that by the time of Revelation 17 is no longer a church that held the power that holds the power it used to a church that is not innocent, but is false and guilty of blood. A church that is not only the only, it's not the only apostate church, but it surely is the mother of them all. And the, the city church here, Babylon the Great, is not the bride of Christ. She is not the true church. The same angel, as in chapter 17, will later take John uh, not to the wilderness, but to the top of a great high mountain in chapter 21, verse 9, where he will show John the bride, the wife of the lamb. And the difference between the bride and the prostitute boils down to love for Jesus. For so many years, I, I understood who Babylon the Great was, but I did not really embrace the reality that for me to be part of the bride of Christ meant I should celebrate Jesus. I should not thirst and hunger for the destruction of his enemies, but thirst and hunger for his word and for the righteousness that he grows in me by his Holy Spirit. As uh, the angel shows to John, the bride, the wife of the lamb in chapter 21, we find that the true church is also a spiritual city. The, the whole number of all who truly love Jesus Christ, who belong to him, who hold to his word, the gospel, and cling to him by faith, to, who cling to his teaching. Chapter 21, verse 10, calls this bride of Christ the holy city Jerusalem, having the glory of God, its radiance like a rare jewel. You see, the thing that makes the, the church of Christ beautiful is the church's love for her Savior. 
And that's demonstrated by devotion to his word, to his authority, submission to him in obedience and humble admiration. Humble adoration, I should say. The, the church of the, the bride of Christ in chapter 21, verse 10, is founded on the, tw the teachings of the 12 apostles. And it's portrayed that way. Clinging to the doctrine, to the, to the teaching of the Christian faith that the apostles have entrusted to us in later, later generations by the New Testament writings. And I want to ask myself in this morning and just sort of check my own heart as I ask you to check your heart. Does this kind of devotion to Christ and to his word, does this sincere love that is appropriate for the bride of the Lamb, does this describe you? In Revelation 17, verse 7, the woman being carried by the beast is not the wife of the lamb. She is an adulterous and unfaithful imposter who claims to be the queen of King Jesus. And here's what I see as the lesson for us from this passage. The truths the angel reveals to John here in these verses about this false church is a gracious warning from God to keep you from betraying Jesus Christ. The first point I want to share is from verse 7, that the angel reveals the decline of Babylon the Great. The angel corrects John's astonishment and, and corrects that astonishment with truth. He reveals the truth about Babylon and the beast. And so as we see here, the first word of Revelation 17, verse 7, is the word but. Look with me at this verse. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. What follows in the next verses is, is like a helpful rebuke from this angel to, to the apostle John, a rebuke like, you know, one of those one of those really good sermons that, that hits you right where you live and forces you to, to a bit of an accounting, a reckoning, to get yourself right with God, to correct something in your life. And so the angel says to John in verse 7, Why do you marvel? And yet she is seductive. She is convincing. This, this woman is persuasive and alluring. Look back at verse 2 and you can see this. The people of the earth and the kings of the earth fall for her charms. They are caught up in her allure. They are deceived by her beauty. And so I agree with the, the writer G.K. Beale in his massive commentary on, on the book of Revelation where he says, there is a likelihood that John was also attracted in some way to the Babylonian woman. John said, when I saw her, I marveled greatly. That's in the middle of verse 6. When I saw her, I marveled greatly, he said. But the Greek text for that really is, it doubles up on the word marvel to say, I marveled a marvel. I marveled a marvel, which is just making it really intense. It's, it's an intense marveling that John is talking about there. But then John in the Greek adds the word great. So I marveled a great marvel, which makes it even more intense, showing that he was intensely amazed and intensely astonished by this woman that he saw named Babylon the Great, the great prostitute. And it seems that the, the power that the prostitute had to intoxicate the dwellers of the earth back in verse 2 even affected John. Not that he was intoxicated by her, but that he felt some of the effect of her power. At least to some degree. And I want to affirm that John is a good and faithful man. John here is a follower of Jesus Christ who was faithful, who endured suffering for the sake of the gospel and the sake of Jesus' name. He surely was not about to let himself be, be caught up and drawn in by this woman. But that doesn't mean he didn't sense some of the attraction. He seems here to recoil after that from the sight of her. And the word he used, marvel, 
does often have this, uh, at least an element of fear to it. So Beale says, perhaps a good translation would be awestruck, in the sense of struck by a fear and awe of her. Let me ask you this. Have you ever felt your flesh, your human flesh, attracted to and tempted by something that in your mind and in your heart you knew was wrong and you rejected? Nonetheless, you felt the, the power of that attraction. It is one of the great realities of history that the false church portrayed by Babylon the Great openly appealed to people's flesh and still does, flaunting wealth and grandeur, flaunting position and power, seeking to affect people's behavior through a religion that, that employs not the word of God and the preaching of his truth under the, the powerful um, agency of the Holy Spirit, but seeking to use other means, uh, appealing to their senses, especially to the sense of sight, to get people to fall into line. Where Christ changes people's hearts in a marvelous and powerful and spiritual way uh, by his Holy Spirit, by the preaching of his word. This prostituted church has always been ignorant of that power of God's word, and so she relies on other means to promote her religion. But I want you to know here, and I want you to, to take it to heart, that even true Christians can be drawn in by her wiles and by her enticements. John was not immune to her allure, and neither are you or I. So the angel addresses and confronts and, and sort of corrects John's visceral reaction to this prostitute by exposing the truth about her. But to make this brief application, I just want to say, don't you long for a day when you will finally be free of the, the sin in your heart? When you will finally be free of... of that power to tempt you to do and to love and to be attracted to what you know is wrong and what you know is wicked. Don't you long for that day when you will be changed so that you will always respond rightly to what is good and you will always turn away from even the slightest hint of evil? Don't you long for that day? And in the meantime, while we wait for that day to come, Aren't you so thankful for the, the corrective ministry of the Holy Spirit that I think is in le at least in some way represented here by the coming of this angel to John? The corrective ministry of God's Holy Spirit by his word and by his spirit that, that breaks that, that spell that sin often has over us. That trains us from the heart to love and to celebrate what is true and what is good and what is pure and what is lovely. In the meantime, while we wait for that day of resurrection, when all things are made new and sin no longer has even a presence in our lives, until as we wait for that day, until that day comes, we must be people who thank God from the heart for the, for the great and wonderful sanctifying work that he is doing in us by his spirit, through his word. We must be people who devote ourselves to the word of God. So in verse 7, the angel says, Why do you marvel? And the angel goes on to say, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast. And what he explains to John, how the angel interprets these symbols for John in verses 8 through 18, it serves to strip away the woman's mystique and remove her mystery. But you will never understand this if you are not ready to think and to diligently apply yourself to these scriptures. Revelation is a treasure, but it's not a treasure that is simply unlocked and ready for you to take hold of. It's a treasure that is unlocked by faithful, wise, persistent reading and the study of God's word in prayer and dependence on the Holy Spirit. A mystery. 
This is a mystery that the angel unfolds to John and reveals the truth about to John. A mystery, the word in, in the New Testament means something that is unknown and hidden. And so this angel begins to illumine and reveal and expose the truth about this woman, Babylon the Great, the truth about the beast that she rides, her relationship with the beast. But none of this is simple. If it was simple, there, there wouldn't be so many different interpretations and so many books written uh, pushing one view or another about the book of Revelation. It's not simple. So look closely with me this morning. And let's think carefully together this morning. And let's ask that right now, even again, that the Holy Spirit would give us understanding and illumine this text for us so that we would benefit from these verses this morning. It, doesn't it make sense that the God who created our brains also created us with hearts and the brains that he has given us are meant to learn and be informed so that the hearts he has given us would love what is right and good and holy and true, those things that come from him. We as human, peop we as human creatures, we are made as a whole package. Body, soul, spirit, heart. We are made to employ all of who we are in the service and in the worship of our God. And I, I want to just use say that as a, a bit of a, a caution this morning. Don't think we can benefit from God's word in the all the ways, all the fullness that we are meant to. If we sort of think we can park our brains in church on Sunday morning and not have to think carefully about what is written in his word. He calls us to read and to hear and to heed, to keep what is written in this book. And that surely, that promise in chapter 1, verse 3 requires diligence. It requires study. And so I call you to join me in that this morning. The first thing to notice here and look closely with me at is that in verse 7, the word mystery is singular. It's not mysteries. It's not the mysteries of the woman and the, the, of Babylon and the beast. It's, it's the mystery both of the woman and of the beast. It's one mystery. There is no woman apart from the beast, and for a very, very long time, there was no beast apart from this woman. By exposing the mystery, the angel will reveal who the woman is, but also what the symbol represents in real life. And as we see that, as we also discover what the beast represents in real life, we are meant to have an obedient reaction to this. As God's word teaches us, so that we are kept from betraying Jesus Christ. This is a gracious gift, what we learn in this passage. That is a gracious gift from God to keep us from betraying our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But notice here then what he says, the angel, still in verse 7, about the status of, of the, the relationship between the beast and Babylon here at this point. The angel says the beast carries her. He carries her. And I want you to notice that word carries. It's an important word. In Romans 11 verse 18, Paul used this same word for carries to say that branches do not support the root. Can you imagine that? A tree upside down where branches supported the root. Rather, he says, the root supports, he uses that word carries, the root supports the branches. It's the same word Paul uses in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, where he says, bear one another's burdens, carry one another's burdens, bear them. In Revelation 2, verse 2, Jesus uses the same word for carries and says that he knows you cannot bear with those who are evil. The next verse in chapter 2, verse 3, Jesus uses the same word again, saying that he knows you are bearing up for my name's sake and have not grown weary. So then when we see this word carries in verse 7, when the angel says the beast carries the woman, he's clarifying what we read in verse 3, that the woman was sitting on the beast and by saying now that he carries her, the beast carries the woman, we learn that she is not its rider, she is its passenger. The beast bears the woman, puts up with the woman, supports the woman, and carries the woman. When John sees this woman being carried on the back of the beast in the wilderness, he sees her at a time when she is no longer in control. She's a passenger and the beast now has to carry her. 
And as we'll see next week in verse 16, we find that the beast now hates this woman. The rest of the chapter, chapter 17, after verse 14, that we'll finish at verse 14 this morning, the rest of the chapter uh, goes on to describe and to unveil the mystery of that woman, that Babylon. But the first portion of, pa of this passage, verses 7 through 14, the passage for us this morning, looks at unveiling the mystery of the beast. The truth that the angel reveals here shows that in the era of the seven bowls of chapter 16, the era that we're living in today, that the great prostitute is in a far more precarious position than she even realizes. And what we learn here is a gracious warning from God, from God's word, to keep you from betraying Jesus Christ. So now in verses 8 through 11, the angel reveals the identity and the destiny of the beast. Keep in mind that the scene that John saw in verse 3 and what the angel said in verse 7, the woman sits on the beast, but the truth is that the beast carries her and supports her, is burdened by her. And this is bad news from, for Babylon because the beast is destined to be destroyed. Look at verse 8 with me. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And go to destruction. The, the, the angel has told John the end from the beginning. The angel has sort of already given us a plot spoiler. Well, that's not a very good storytelling, is it? But it's about time that we find out what happens to this beast. It's about time we read about the beast's destruction. John's readers were already introduced to the beast from the bottomless pit in chapter 11. And in that prediction, the beast killed Christ's witnesses. And then John's readers were introduced to a dragon with seven heads, just like the seven heads and ten horns this beast has. In chapter 12, John's readers were introduced to a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And in that prediction, it persecuted the followers of Christ. And then John's readers were introduced in chapter 13. Uh, to a beast with seven heads and ten horns, and in that prediction it blasphemed God and waged war against the saints. And now John is given by the angel the keys to unlocking the meaning of these symbols so that God's people would one day be able to identify the beast, to understand who is this enemy of the true church, who is this enemy of those who follow the Lamb of God. Look with me at verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. The angel here reveals the truth about the beast and its seven heads and ten horns. And it says that the beast is going to destruction, taking the woman Babylon with them. Their fate was sealed as soon as they started persecuting Jesus and his church. As soon as they started persecuting Christians who follow Jesus and cling to his gospel. See, if you wage war against Jesus Christ, this is what will happen. If you wage war against Christ and his church, there's no other savior to save you. Anyone who makes war on the Lamb of God is going to have to account one day with the wrath of God, is going to suffer the wrath of God. But it's amazing to me, and I, I, think, it's, I think it's worth noting, that other than the devil himself, in all of Scripture, nobody else in history has had his doom announced so far in advance and published so widely as this beast and his doom is, is published and announced and predicted in Scripture repeatedly. Daniel 7, 600 years before Christ, Daniel 7 predicted the judgment and the destruction of this beast. 600 years before the first advent of Christ, 
And now again, the angel at the end of the first century is showing to John what's in store for this beast centuries before it happens, centuries before the beast even ever began to persecute God's people. For centuries beforehand then, Christians who read the book of Revelation, Christians who knew and understood and read the book of Daniel, had a, a, a great and powerful awareness that this enemy was coming to history, was going to rise up and one day persecute the church. They, they were forewarned and they knew what was coming. For centuries, Christians knew that this enemy was going to rise and ravage the churches of Jesus Christ. But as just as surely as God's word forewarned them and foretold the suffering that they would encounter under the beast. Just as sure and as certain as that, God's word also foretold their salvation through death. And God's word also foretold the vengeance that Jesus would exact on their enemy. And from the time of the prophet Daniel, it has been a great comfort to the whole Christian church to have this prophecy showing how it all would end. That's, I think, one of the just beautiful details of the fact that in verse 8, the angel tells John, even before he identifies the beast, that the beast is on its way to destruction. The first thing then that the angel next tells John is, is that the, the beast was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit. And I don't want you to worry too much about that those details right now, but we'll come back to that. But notice the main point here in verse 8. The main point about this in verse 8 is, is, is that it's meant to sound like a resurrection. He was and is not and is about to rise. He's about to rise. It sounds like the resurrection. The rise of the beast as though from the dead would be so astonishing when it was fulfilled, when it happens. So astonishing to the people who witnessed that event that they would be convinced the beast's power comes from God. So again, as we look to see how is this fulfilled, one mark of the fulfillment, one mark of those who are taken in and captivated by the beast, those who worship the beast, is that they are absolutely convinced the beast represents God. In fact, it says, those whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, verse 8, those whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, those who are not God's chosen, predestined, elect children, those who are not true believers and followers of Jesus, they will marvel, it says, at the sight of the beast. That's the same word with which John marveled a great marvel in verse 6. It's the same word, and unlike John, who would not allow himself to worship the prostitute, these people did worship the power of the beast. Their whole religion was built around the beast. But the angel shows the truth here. The truth is that the beast, when he rises, is going to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Its power is demonic, not divine. It's from the bottomless pit. It rises symbolically from hell. In verse 9, the identity of the resurrected beast is given to John in a, in, it's kind of a riddle. And it's a riddle that it says it calls for wisdom, just like the riddle of the number of the beast in chapter 13, verse 18. So look with me at verse 9, and let's apply our minds to that riddle. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. God gave this clue, I think, in a riddle. Well, clearly God gave this clue in a riddle form, but it's a riddle that's meant to be understood, but it's not easy to understand. It would, it, it would not be easy to work out, but it would be possible to have a clear and, and knowledgeable understanding of what this actually is saying. God's word is given to us so that we can understand it. He says the, the Holy Spirit inspiring the, every word of what John wrote as he recorded what the angel tells him here. So God himself in, in multiple ways affirms here that this calls for wisdom. 
The seven heads of the first beast are a symbol with multiple meanings. The seven heads of the beast, that is, are a symbol with multiple meanings that are clues for us to understand who this beast is. First, the first clue is that the seven heads are identified as seven mountains on, on which the woman, the false church, is seated. We see that because she is being carried by the beast, and this, these seven heads of the beast are seven mountains. For John's original readers to talk about a, a city church that, that's seated on seven mountains, that was an unmistakable reference. For John's original readers, it was a very thinly veiled reference to the, city, the seven hills of the city of Rome. You can Wikipedia this. You can look it up on Wikipedia to see that, that those hills in Rome were known as the Palatine, the Capitoline, the Quirinal, the Viminal, the Esquiline, the Calin, and the Aventine Mountains. Seven mountains on which the city of Rome is built to, to this day. And in case it wasn't quite clear before now, we see finally that this is very sure and very certainly about the city of Rome. The second clue in this verse is that the seven heads also stand for seven kings, and we see this in verse 10. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. Again, uh, this is about Roman history. When I preached on Revelation chapter 12 about the dragon with the seven heads, I said this. The seven heads represent the seven kinds of heads of government that ruled the Roman Empire throughout history. The Roman historians, Livy and Tacitus, both identify the first five, kings, consuls, dictators, decemvirs, and military tribunes. The sixth, emperors, was begun by Caesar Augustus, and that was the form of government John was living in at the end of the first century when he wrote this. Those were Roman historians who said that. Those were Roman historians who were talking about a part of Rome's history that was famous and well understood. In John's lifetime, the story of the city of Rome could be told by describing the five successive kinds of government that there were in the past, and now the sixth that was introduced by Caesar Augustus, the sixth kind of government, when Rome became an empire led by an emperor. The seventh, the angel tells John here, has not yet come. And that was something that had not yet happened when John wrote this around the year 95 AD. So the angel says another kind of government, the seventh, has not yet come. It's still in the future from John's point of view at John's point in, in history. But when it does come, the angel says he must remain only a little while. Again, in Roman history, it shows that the seventh form of the Roman government was fairly short-lived, was introduced by... Um, Diocletian, when he established co-emperors and he reorganized the whole Roman Empire at the end of the, uh, early in the 4th century. And so altogether then, there were seven forms of constitutional Roman government that, that the seven heads or the seven kings or types of government, if you will. But there was one more yet to come. And in this verse, we see that this is an eighth but it belongs to the seven. Verse 11, as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. The beast that wowed the world with its apparent rise from the dead, the beast that seduced people to worship it and ascribe to it the power of God. Now we know what the, the general beast stands for, what the whole beast with the, the first seven heads stands for. We understand here that the beast with seven heads represents the Roman Empire at various points in its, in its lifetime, in its history, as it evolved from one form of government to another through all seven heads, one after another. Up until the fall of the Roman Empire, which happened in the year 476, we understand that. But what does this eighth head stand for? What does the other head stand for? What is represented by the symbol of the, the head that, that was and is not and is yet to come? What is represented by the resurrection of this head as if from the dead so that people worship it? The beast under the control of the persecuting 
anti-Christian head that was, then was not, then was rise to, was to rise from the pit of hell. What is the truth about this beast and its eighth head? And the third clue here we get in verse 11 is to the identity of the beast is this. The beast that was to come so far in the future from when John wrote this was an eighth era of Roman government. But verse 11 shows us that it also belonged to one of the earlier, earlier seven. And I know this is difficult to follow. This text of scripture is difficult to follow. But when Rome was decapitated at the overthrow of the empire in the 5th century, it was really soon reborn under rulers who, who not only ruled the city of Rome, but were also the high priests of the church in Rome. They were just like they were the, the old pagan emperors at John's time who were then the, the heads of the Roman cult that where they were worshipped as gods in, in temples to their name all over the Roman Empire. The eighth head, the eighth form of Roman government that John was shown here that was predicted by this angel was a form of Roman government that resurrected the old emperor cult and wrapped it in Christian robes. This began the dynasty of the popes as the heads of the Church of Rome and the kings of the city of Rome and the, the heads of all the kingdoms loyal to Rome. And that situation lasted for more than a thousand years. But verse 11 says, never mind all that history, it goes to destruction. It doesn't matter how long some evil tyrant is allowed to continue on persecuting God's people. The promise is clear here that it goes to destruction. And that's how God predestined the reign of the popes to end. And that brings us to the ten horns of the beast in verses 12 through 14. But again, I want to put the main point of this, this whole passage before you and ask you to remember that this um, interpretation given by the angel, what the angel shows us here and reveals about the mystery of the beast the truths that this angel re reveals to John about the beast and the false church, it's a gracious warning from God to keep you from betraying Jesus Christ. Finally then, the angel reveals the doom of the beast and its ten horns. Look with me at verses 12 through 14. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. The angel interprets the, the, the symbol of the ten horns to mean that they are ten kings or kingdoms. So again, if you were to make a list of all the symbols in the book of Revelation, you're pretty far down that list now. If you've been uh, following carefully through all the, all the book of Revelation, now you can identify horns equals kingdoms in this vision. The horns of the beast, the horns of the seven heads, represent the ten kingdoms that are joined to the beast. But the main point here is not so much to get distracted about who are those ten kingdoms. I think I'll touch on that next week, and I've touched on it before. The main point here is to notice their unity with the beast. The ten kingdoms are as one with the beast in a war against Christ. And we see that in these verses, 12 to 14, and especially verses 13 and 14. If you want to figure out what the ten kingdoms are, you don't really need to look any further than to identify who are those ten nations that rose up in Western Europe when the old Roman Empire fell. And what ten nations have filled those same borders ever since? On and off, but there's generally been ten. And I'll come back to that, as I said, next week. Right now, though, notice in verse 12, the angel tells John that at that time, these weren't kingdoms yet. That was still far into the future when John wrote the book of Revelation. But they would receive kingly authority in the future together with the beast. Notice those words, together with the beast. That happened in the 6th and 7th centuries. And the main point emphasized in verses 12 to 14 is, is this point that shows why Babylon's position 
precariously perched on the on the back of the beast, being carried and supported by the beast, is is such a dangerous position. Why her doom is indicated and spelled out from the beginning. The end of verse 12 says that these ten kings are together with the beast. Verse 13 says this. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. The doom of the prostitute is sealed because she depends on the beast. And the doom of these ten kingdoms is sealed because they are united with the beast. And the doom of the prostitute, the ten kingdoms, and the beast altogether is sealed because of whom they are united against. And that's verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Maybe you've seen a, a movie where the audience cheered when the villain got what he deserved in the end. For me, one of the, the clearest example I can think of of a movie like that is The Lion King. And I've mentioned this before where Scar, the, the, the evil brother of King Mufasa, finally at the end of the movie, Scar is, uh, he gets, he get, well, he gets what he deserves for as his army of hyenas turns against him and attacks him. And I cheered. I admit it, I cheered. Maybe maybe you feel more, you know, that you resonate with the, the end of the villain in The Princess Bride. As finally Inigo Montoya catches up with the, the, the six-fingered man, Count Rugen, and, uh, and just before he kills him, he says, he delivers this famous line, you know what that is, and then he says, I want my father back, and he, and he kills his enemy. But here's what I, I want to consider. Just use that for a minute and then consider this. What makes us cheer at moments like that? When the villain gets what they deserve. When the bad guy gets what's coming to him. Is it, is it that the bad guy is finally punished or is it that the good guy finally gets his revenge? What makes our hearts respond to that? Do you see in verse 14 how profound excuse me, how profound this is, that God's justice will one day be delivered upon this beast, upon the prostitute, upon the ten kingdoms with them. Do you see how profound this is? They will make war on the Lamb. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. The implication here is that if you attack and make war on Christ's people, you are making war on Christ himself, the Son of God. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. If you have not yet bent your knee to Jesus Christ and owned him as your Lord, given him your obedience, pledged to him your life and your service, and thanked him for his salvation, which is so free and gracious to save sinners like you and me, then do that this morning. Do that right now. Bend the knee to Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and pledge yourself to him. Ask that he would take you and forgive you and make you his child, part of his kingdom, one of his followers, that his blood would cover your sins and you would be made acceptable to God through faith in Jesus. Do that this morning. Like Paul, who persecuted the early church, found out when Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The beast and those united with him one day are going to find out that the whole time they thought they were fighting for Christendom, they were actually fighting against Jesus Christ. They thought that they served Christ, but they never loved his word. They never clung to, by faith to his gospel. They never depended upon his grace. Their religion is a religion of works that arrogantly boasts that people can do something to save themselves, to atone for their own sins. The truth that we learn from this angel, from what this angel reveals to John, 
about the mystery of the beast, it is a gracious warning from God to keep you and me from coming close to betraying our Lord Jesus Christ. So instead of cheering at the destruction of the Antichrist, check your own heart. Do you love Jesus? When those who have finally been betrayed, when those who finally betray Jesus are destroyed, on that day, I do not think that you and I will, will cheer because the bad guy gets what he deserved. On that day when the wicked are punished, I do not think that any of us will rejoice because of their punishment, because they get justice in the end. I think we will weep that the name of our Lord had suffered so much dishonor for so long. I don't think we will rejoice at the punishment of the wicked. I think we will rejoice when the honor of our Lord is at last vindicated in all of creation, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The anti-Christian popes and the Christendom they used to rule were united against Christ, united against the Lamb, against his gospel. And for centuries they persecuted the followers of Jesus Christ, martyrs of Christ and his good word. The Protestant Reformation recovered that gospel that had been lost and buried in blood. The Protestant Reformation recovered so much of the truth of the doctrines of the New Testament. But the Protestant Reformation for many seems to be something we go on protesting. Stop protesting. What should unite Christians is not what we are against or who we are against. That's what characterizes the beast and the fall, the beast and, and the ten kingdoms and the and the seven heads and, and the Babylon itself is who they are united in war against. We should not be defined as followers of Christ by who we are against, but by who we follow. Our common cause is not who we oppose or what we oppose. Our union, our fellowship is in Jesus. That's it. Babylon and the beast are doomed because they betrayed the Lamb. Do not let ourselves be defined by what you hate or by what you protest. Be defined by who you serve, who you love, and how you love him. The one that you worship, the one that you love above every other. Be defined by the Lamb. As the end of verse 14 acknowledges his glory and his position, be defined by him. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Called and chosen. This is grace. You're not called and chosen because you deserve it. You're not called and chosen because you came forward and volunteered for Christ's army. You are not called and chosen because of you at all. You are called and chosen because of his grace to you. No one is a Christian because they deserve it. You are saved by grace and grace alone, unmerited favor and kindness from God through Jesus. So be faithful now to him, to him who called you and chose you and gave his life to save you. Be faithful to him and let that define you. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I pray that you will do this for us. That you will use this reminder and these lessons as the angel that you sent revealed to John the truth about Babylon and the beast. That as we looked at this, this prophecy about the mystery of the beast, that Lord, you would use this to keep us, to keep our hearts from betraying Jesus. That we would certainly not be amongst those who would wage war against Christ, but Lord, that also you would keep us from being among those who neglect Christ who take him for granted, or among those who, who love the idea of truth more than we love the Lamb himself. Would you please again, Lord, 
overturn the sin in our hearts and show us what we need to confess. Purify us as your people and make us like a bride deep in love with her Savior and King. Would you purify your church, even in Beacon Church this morning? Would you continue to do this, not just for our sakes, but for the glory and the honor of the name of Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and is our Lord and Master? We pledge this and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.